to recap, um, we had some great questions from some students about, um, you know, how do I manage going through school with isolation um, in this sort of quarantine Zoom era when you're not getting a lot of peer support and finding ways to find even peer support online so you can kind of use the downsides of being in the uh, Zoom era uh, to your advantage. Um, we had a question about uh, managing mentorship when your mentor is your boss and how do you seek good mentorship and how do you develop a healthy mentorship relationship. Um, we had a question about um, you know, the downsides of TRT, kind of explaining testosterone replacement therapy um, uh, and some of, the, some of the alternatives to that. Uh, we had some questions about um, you know, uh, mental health um, and how that affects inflammation, how that affects testosterone, different behavioral strategies to attenuate or reduce inflammation and also improve our hormone function. We talked a little bit about um, different factors that negatively affect hormone function, uh, including depression, obesity, and these environmental uh, pollutants, uh, these endocrine disrupting chemicals, and ways that you can sort of mitigate that. And then finally, we had a great question about um, uh, you know, gut health uh, and how we can improve sort of uh, inflammation and sort of in inflammatory bowel diseases and ulcerative colitis. Awesome. Welcome everyone to Maximus Colin Radio Show uh, 15, I believe. 14, 15, 15. Amazing. Uh, thank you for everyone who's joining us. Uh, got a good crowd going on Discord. Got our Instagram going. And, and shout out to folks who are joining us on YouTube Live as well. I think we got Clubhouse going today as well. So uh, we got a nice mix of people and happy to take any questions. As always, we always prioritize live questions. Um, we do have some user submitted questions in the queue as well that we can always go back to, but uh, always always like people who are joining us live and like, like to reward those folks. So uh, for the folks that are joining us, if you have any questions or you want just want to chat, we can keep it casual today as well. Uh, feel free to chime in. Hey, Dr. Can I have a quick question? Yes, sir. So I want to uh, first start off by thanking you. I've uh, been listening for a few weeks and been implementing a lot of great frameworks and been meditating too. So awesome. thank you so much. Um, I saw your tweet earlier today. Sorry for the windshield wipers. It's raining in the <laughs> Bay Area, but um, no worries. I, I saw your tweet earlier today about mentorship. Yes. Uh, I would love for you to unpack that. Specifically, I'm early in my career or just graduated in 2020. Uh -huh. So there's a lot of uncertainty the past year or so. I'm starting to see, you know, light. Um, you know, um, start to see the light, you know, with the vaccines coming through and right. um, more certainty coming. So I would love for you to talk a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah. And and in terms of your, your kind of impetus for asking, are you, are you like looking for mentorship? Are you curious about how to find a mentor? What, what What's your kind of aim? Oh, yeah. Perfect. Um, so I'm actually currently like interning slash contracting for a mentor. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of interesting. Um, you started out as a mentor through college, the college network, and then yeah. now um, I'm working for him specifically. And it's interesting because I'm learning a lot, but at the same time, it's kind of hard to have that previous uh, mentorship when you're working with your mentors. So uh -huh. I love uh, kind of regarding mentorship in a working environment and then also outside, like externally. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's a it's a it's a big thing. A lot of people want a mentor, um, and it is it is hard to find. So I guess I guess sort of the first question is, how the hell do I find a mentor? Um, and you know, it's a tricky question. I, I do think with anything in life, you can certainly the the amount of effort that you put into things, you, you know, you kind of reap what you sow. Um, you know, the challenge is, it's like quite frankly, being a mentor is kind of a thankless job, um, and it, it's probably like uh, certainly not financially rewarding, uh, and it's because it's usually a volunteer kind of thing. You do you usually do it out of the goodness of your heart. Like the way that I mentor is, I'm a clinical professor at UCSF School of Medicine. Um, I don't do it for financial reasons. I do it because I I like teaching and I I like being around students and I like training the next generation of doctors. So uh, that's the way that I sort of give back. Um, and so that's a nice, like, no one's looking for that. It's an elective, essentially. If you're a fourth year resident at UCSF, you can just sign up and you can kind of get that. And it is mentorship in the sense that um, they're already seeing patients in the hospital. We train them in how to do a particular type of treatment, which is ACT or acceptance and commitment therapy. So I actually think um, 
uh, it is optimal to try to find uh, mentors through work if you're looking for a professional kind of mentor. Um, I'm curious though, in your experience, you, you mentioned that this person was kind of your mentor before and now you work for him and you notice that the dynamic has sort of changed. Well, why do you feel like it's become harder now that you're kind of employed uh, you know, by him? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, it's just different because like, you can't be as candid candid or like as uh-huh. um, upfront because at the same time, um, my, my boss or like my mentor, he's looking out for his like best interests, which is like the company. Right. And I'm kind of looking out for that as well. But at the same time, you kind of have to be upfront with your kind of your objective at the end of the day and you know, or not objective, but like your long-term, you know, goals and stuff like that and how that aligns. So like from my standpoint is like, I love working for him, but the industry that he's building his companies in e-commerce, I'm more passionate about real estate and the technology aspect around real estate. Mm -hmm. So like, that's what I want to do long term. So, um, but like, we're kind of trying to figure out, okay, like how can we work together and stuff like that? So I think it's working out well. It's just, um, I want to kind of continue the mentorship or like the continue the mentor and mentee relationship, right. but without burning any bridges. Yeah. No, if it, I decide I want to move on. Yeah, that's, it's a great point. And, and, you know, you do bring up a valid assertion in the sense that, um, the, the, you, you have to be kind of, um, skilled and, and kind of circumspect in terms of what you share with a manager. There are the type of managers you can really be open about everything. Like, for instance, there are a lot of startups where people might come into it and say, look, I want to be here for a year or two and I want to go start my own company. And that's my goal. It's a good learning experience. I'm going to you know, work like hell for you. But this is not like the long term place that I want to be. And I just want to be super upfront about that. Now, that may not work for a lot of places and may not work for a lot of managers. For some people, it, it can. And so it's always hard when you tell a manager, hey, this is not the area that I want to be in or it's not my passion or I want to move on and do other things. Um, I think if you can build towards that relationship, that's optimal. But this is a little bit of the art of it. So the things that I would kind of suggest is, um, you know, it's a little bit of your discernment to figure out like how how open or flexible is this manager? Do you kind of have a hard ass manager who's like, more on the disagreeable spectrum, a little bit more paranoid. He's like, I don't want to lose people. And so the moment that you say, hey, I, I'm not kind of feeling this or this is not my dream job or I want to move into a different sector, he kind of loses interest or engagement. If that's the case, unfortunately, like you could probably have to be a little bit skilled in terms of like, you know, shutting your mouth. Um, I hate to say it, but look, it, it, this is a reality of work. And I, I feel like I, in fact, People, young people don't get mentored about this enough. I actually have direct firsthand experience about this, by the way, because when I went to grad school, I went to UCLA, um, you know, here in my backyard of LA, it's the number one clinical psych program in the country. But the the downside of it is like the, even though it's a clinician scientist program, they train people to be clinicians and professors. The only thing they want you to do is be a professor. Like if you want, if you said, I want to go out and practice and help people, they'd be like, nah, you're not coming here. That's not what we do. We're, we're trying to literally create more professors to be our replacement. And so the reality was 50% of people did go on to practice, but they couldn't say anything to their mentors or their um, you know research advisors, essentially. You kind of have to like close, close your mouth for four years, go through the motions. And then when it's time to graduate, you're like, ah, I'm taking a different direction in my life. I wish that was not the case and that you could be a lot more open about it, but that's the reality of that workplace dynamic, right? So... If that's the kind of, this is what you have to kind of assess. And that's, that really depends individually with that manager is how close of a relationship do I have? What is their personality? Can I be a little bit more open? And what I would suggest is you can even test the waters a little bit, right? Like you don't have to go all out and like, you know, put your heart on your sleeve and say, okay, this is, this is all of my feelings. You can kind of put a little bit out there and see how he responds, right? Do a little self-disclosure, you know, uh, and if you find that like, the more and more open that you're being, he's being more and more welcoming, empathic, receptive to to things, then you can go all out and be like, hey, I'm thinking about leaving or I'm thinking about you know a different path, right? So it doesn't have to be like, oh, I have to take this huge risk up front and, and kind of ruin our relationship. But I, but I do think it's worth testing the waters because it is optimal that you can have like, you know, uh, a, a hybrid relationship where they are your manager, 
but they care about you as a human being. And I'll tell you an anecdotal story about this that I had in my own experience, right? So in my first company at, at, at Omada, I ran this clinical innovation team. And I had this guy that I hired who I believe the role was like, he was like a behavioral scientist. It was someone who was like coming in and applying behavioral science to help our product be better in terms of best practices. The thing is though, he was like an amazing quant guy, very good with data. He loved doing like uh, analyses and I tried to like leverage that strength into his job where it, where it was appropriate. But the thing is like there was a data science team there and it was like stepping on too many toes if he was doing that too much. And I kind of told him, I was like, look, I think in terms of, um, you know, what you're doing and your skill sets, I think you should just be a data scientist, um, whether that's here or quite frankly somewhere else. But I was like, you know, the best thing you should do, you already have a PhD, is go back, go to a data science boot camp. It's like eight to 12 weeks. Um, they'll kind of retrain you a little bit and then go back on the job market and get a job as a data scientist. And he was kind of taken aback because it's weird when your manager comes to you and says, hey, I don't think this is the right job for you in terms of your long-term growth. And so he didn't listen to me because he was like, I don't want to leave my job. I love working for you. I love working for this company. But he kind of he kind of got it. And so I think like six months later, uh, like the company was going through changes uh, and it kind of the position sort of didn't work out for him. But then he did exactly what I told him to do. He went and retrained as a data scientist and then got a great job at another similar company as a data scientist where he's there and kicking butt and he loves what he's doing. So um, it was just a great example though of like, I, I told him like the, the day that I hired him, I was like, look, I, I want obviously for you to do the best that you can and contribute to this company. But I think about everything as a long-term relationship. And so I was thinking about his best interests at heart, which is like long-term, like, you know, it was, it was best for him to be someplace else and in quite frankly, a different role. And I was in fact, the one that was telling him that, um, but it was, it was hard, uh, to kind of navigate that. And hopefully, you know, I created a good condition for that, but you know, it, it I really do believe in the concept of karma because funnily, you know, I helped him kind of transition into that new, new, new position, that new career. Um, while I was kind of going through a transition, I was working in venture capital and investing. I, I had a data science project that I needed and he like totally helped me out for it because I, you know, helped place him there. And so it, it kind of came back. I obviously wasn't doing it with, with uh, any expectation of return, but it, it was such a nice story of seeing someone transition to a good place, f find and really leverage his strengths into doing what he was best able to do. And then he was able to help me uh, with that as well. So um, I, I would say, you know, that's kind of my advice for, for kind of navigating your mentorship sort of relationship is, is kind of test the waters, see, see how open he is. Um, and hopefully you can move towards that where you can be as, as honest as that person is willing to tolerate maybe is the best way to put it. And then over time, try to find managers that do have your best interest in heart. I'll tell you an interesting research statistic, which is, um, the, the biggest predictor of job satisfaction is whether you perceive that your manager genuinely cares about your well-being. It's such an interesting thing. It has nothing to do with the job itself. It's like, does this person, quite frankly, give a shit about me? Um, and, and about, you know, whether my personal health, my professional success, does he, does, do they really care or do they treat me like a cog in the wheel? And that one question alone really determines, quite frankly, um, you know, how happy you are. And, and the old saying, I think, is true. People leave managers they don't leave jobs and so that's like the, the biggest piece, piece of mentorship and advice i can give you is long term too even above and beyond this particular mentor or manager that you have try to find people as much as you can that you work for that you think they genuinely care about your well-being and people that you really admire and respect right both professionally ideally personally as well um not always easy to find but it's 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 worth doing because i've seen a lot of people in fact become very, very successful, quite frankly, just following around a great person who's like a superstar. And, uh, you know, because if they're a superstar, they're going to go and work for better and better companies or start their own companies. And you can almost like follow in their, their, their tailwinds in a lot of ways, if you find the right people. And then the other thing too, is, you know, that if you work for them, regardless of what company they're at, you're always going to work for someone that, that admires and you admire and respect, they care about your well being, and you're always going to be happy. And where one of the, the, the best lessons I learned, I worked for McKinsey when I was 20 years old, similar to your age. And, um, you know, at, at the time I was always like, okay, let me, let me figure out how to get staffed on the sexiest project. 
And that was my my boss's men, uh, mentality too. She was telling me she's a, a, a German engagement manager at McKinsey. She's like, I, that's how I used to pick my projects. But then over time, I, I realized that the team is everything. You're working in an office like 12 hours a day, churning out spreadsheets and presentations. And it really matters a lot more who you work with. And so she's like, I, I don't care what project I'm working on. McKinsey can put me on oil and gas, telecommunications, whatever it is. As long as I'm working with the, with the right people, that matters more than anything. Now, that's one perspective. And, and maybe that's an extreme. Some people obviously do care about what sector they're in or what product they're passionate about. But I think people underestimate the team and the manager very, very much so. So in terms of balancing your you know, priorities and what you're looking for in a job, I would say over index on team and manager because you're almost always underestimating it. All right. Was that helpful? I know that was a lot of information. Yeah, no, super helpful. Um, I kind of, I've kind of figured it out. Like I'm having a one-on-one -on -one next week and mm -hmm. it's kind of a hybrid relationship. Uh, um, it, it, it's kind of like, you know, it goes both, both ways. We're trying to figure it out. Like what is the long term going to look like and kind of figure out how I can help and how I can assist. Um, whether if I like when I like, you know, kind of bridging that gap and, I think uh, that hybrid um, relationship actually works out very well, and, and uh, that's how, what I'm kind of playing towards. And yeah. then, um, yeah, everything that you touched upon was super helpful. Thank you. Yeah, good luck. Good luck with that conversation. Question from YouTube: Currently, a 26-year-old college student in my second to last year of my CS degree. Mm -hmm. I'm currently losing motivation to study and feeling overwhelmed. Any advice on how to turn it around? Sure. I mean, I'd love to know uh, in terms of what your perception is in terms of why you're losing motivation. So if you can you can comment in on the chat, I'd love to sort of hear it because um, there may be a lot of different reasons for that. What what year he said he was he graduating? 26 years old and second to last year of CS degree. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you, you got to tell me what, what your perception is in terms of why you're 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 losing motivation. But if you're in your second to last year, you're basically in your third out of your fourth year um, if you're doing a traditional four-year degree. Um, and I'm going to make a running metaphor because I used to run track and cross country. Um, I always thought like the hardest part of any race is somewhere like two-thirds or three-quarters of the way through, right? When you're running a 5K, you're, it's basically 3.1 miles. The first mile, you're feeling really good. You're very fresh. You're like, oh, you got all the enthusiasm, the adrenaline, and it's kind of sustaining you, right? The last mile, or even the last half mile, I would say, you know, you can literally see the finish line, and that gives you a renewed sense of motivation and energy because you're like, okay, it hurts right now, but I can see the end. And whenever you can see the end of any goal, project, task, uh, you're like, okay, I'm almost there. But it's always that that kind of like two thirds of the way, three quarters of the way mark where you're like, I'm sitting here suffering. It's not going to end anytime soon. I still got a year or two left. Um, and I can't really see the finish line. It's not like I have a quarter semester left. So what I would just say is like, look, it's, it's pretty normal probably what you're experiencing in that you're kind of in the thick of it. You're kind of in the slog of it and you kind of can't see the finish line. So what I would suggest is for, first of all, like it's not, it's not, uh, unusual to feel the way that you feel. It's always like that, that junior year blues, uh, if you want to call it that. But I would say in order to help kind of uh, bolster that a little bit, like think about what it is that motivates you. Like, yes, in a lot of ways, going to college is almost like a social expectation these days in that, yeah, like almost for any like white collar job, you're expected to go through it. Your parents expect you to go it, through it. Your friends are probably going to judge you if you don't. So there's a lot of extrinsic motivators or reasons why you'd go through college. But what's the reason for you? What's your motivation that, that originally got you to go there. And, and maybe you were kind of doing what's expected uh, of you and you didn't sort of um, think it through. But I'd love to hear if you have a little bit more feedback. Yeah, so Justin says um, he's currently doing an online degree and mm -hmm. finds himself just on YouTube doing self-teaching. Yeah. Uh, obviously, he's currently taking out student loans, but he's not getting any instructions from the instructors. Uh, unfortunately, he seems to be carrying a negative mood towards the school and is getting more and more anxious about his current classes as they get harder. Mm -hmm. And he feels incredibly isolated because it's online only and there's no physical classmates. Yeah. See, that, that, I'm, I'm glad you chimed in because I think that provides a lot more context and I can give a lot more 
um, individualized advice. I mean, I feel your pain. Like you're you're in a weird situation, right? Like the, like it's not like how I went to college, right? When I went to college at Harvard, literally everyone, like 99% of people lived in the dorms. Uh, there was like professors who lived there. There's grad students who lived there. They were literally like your, your parents and your siblings. Um, there was a lot of social support. They did a lot for mental health. And even though it was a very high stress, high pressure environment, there was a lot of anxiety that was going on there. Um, there was a lot of resources too, and you weren't, you weren't alone. Um, and so you, we're in this weird quarantine world where you're in like an online school, uh, you're kind of figuring things out by yourself. Um, and it really, uh, it is tough. So I think it's even more normal given the circumstances that you're, you're describing. However, I do think there's a remedy for it in that, look, um, you probably shouldn't be going through and doing it totally by yourself. Yes. You're, you're the responsibility falls on your shoulders in terms of you probably do have to do some self-teaching and self-instruction, but I can guarantee you there's a bunch of other people who are going through exactly what you're going through and you got to figure out a way to get in touch with those people and do it together as a group. So um, I don't know if there's people at your particular degree program or university, but I would reach out if you have classmates in a class and figure out a way that you can work on these things together. Like literally like, you know, you can just, you know, fire up a Zoom uh, or a Discord channel like this and do study sessions together. Um, Cause it, the, whether or not you kind of need it from a programming perspective, you absolutely need it from a social perspective. And, and it's sort of nice to just do homework in parallel, even if you're not even working on the same assignments. If you're generally working on the same thing, like you're trying to be a software engineer or a programmer and you're maybe you're learning two different languages, that's fine. Just being able to talk about what's going on, vent with about stuff, shoot the shit with someone, um, like you're sitting in a library um, and it's not one of the super quiet ones where you can actually talk um, is, is tremendously helpful. So if you can't find it at your university, I actually highly um, recommend you find, um, other forums. There's a, there's a website called career karma, um, that I was just talking, talking about. They actually put people into these small peer groups, um, for people who are learning how to code and software engineer. So I would go to their website, find a group in a community, um, and figure out how to do that, uh, together. Yeah, so Justin says that uh, he actually just started dating someone and applying your quarantine dating advice from a couple calls ago. And now he's just wondering, is it responsible to be dating and juggling school at the same time? Yeah, great question. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm glad you're you're implementing some of that uh, advice. Um, it's a good question about like, um, you know, dating and um, handling school or work. I think, look, in the... Um, relationships should be considered one of the core foundational health behaviors. You know, people always talk about diet, exercise, uh, sleep and stress as kind of like the core foundational health behaviors. I actually take a little bit of a different view in that the five that I always talk about is diet, exercise, sleep. Yes, those are the core three, but the other ones that people don't talk about are focus Right. And that's why my whole, I have this whole thing on dopamine fasting. Like we live in this attention economy and nobody can focus anymore as a result of that. So I really think it's a superpower if you can hone your focus. And then the other one is relationships or intimacy. And it's kind of funny. People don't think about that as a health behavior, even though we know, like, for instance, if you think you're lonely, if your self perception is that you're lonely, you will die sooner. There's tons of research that show that in fact, one of the biggest predictors of mortality or a premature death essentially is loneliness and it's perceived loneliness. It doesn't even matter how many friends you actually have in your network. If you feel lonely, then it's literally not good for your health. So um, I do think it's useful to invest in relationships uh, even in college. Now, here's the thing. Now, it may be premature for you to get married uh, depending on sort of what your life goals are and kind of where you're at in life. But I, I generally don't think it's a good idea to put off and say, I cannot date uh, because I'm going through, um, you know, this this uh, this uh, degree or this job. Now there may be some extreme examples, like maybe you're in investment banking and you're working 100 hours a week. Uh, I, I would question why you're picking that in the first place. But other than kind of extreme examples, I actually think it's a useful life skill to learn how to juggle things, right? So learning how to balance your schoolwork with a relationship is good practice for the future. And whether or not this particular relationship works out, I mean, I hope it does, but 
even if you decide, okay, maybe this is not the, the, the forever, the long-term relationship, it is useful. It's a useful life skill to learn how to balance these things because the reality is, unfortunately, life just gets harder. If you think school is hard, it's going to get harder. Um, you don't have as much freedom uh, as you do when you're in school um, and, and life gets more complicated. And so the better that you can learn to balance these things now, think about it as practice, right? You're practicing for life. You are living your life, but you get to do it in a way that's a little bit safer in the sense that like, you know, you don't get punished as much in school as you do in like a work context when you slip up. Um, and same thing, I think people are in relationships have a little bit looser expectations when you're in your 18 to 22 than they kind of do in their, their late 30s about how serious those kinds of relationships are. So I would say don't, don't preclude yourself and say that you can't have a relationship. The other part of it I think is really helpful is just really practice communication, right? Um, if the, the tricky part about balancing is, is honestly like misaligned expectations. People like if they're demanding you spend a ton of time with them there, first of all, it's like, it's helpful for you to practice assertiveness and be like, Hey, look, I, I'm trying to get like good grades this semester. This is what I need. This is the time that I need to spend. I, you are absolutely important to me as well, but this is, this is how much I can reasonably contribute. And this is how I can make up for it. Like for instance, I'll tell you an anecdote. I have CEO clients. They're incredibly busy and a lot of them are in relationships, but the way that they try to structure it is they, for instance, often schedule a weekly date night with their girlfriend or their wives or whatever it is, because it's dedicated time. Now, obviously they need more time than just that date night, but there's something magical psychologically about, I know that's protected time. My significant other is giving it to me. We're going to make it special. We're going to go out to dinner, a uh, little bit of whining and dining and romance that makes it, uh, that almost can, can make up for a lot in fact. Um, versus if you're very, very ad hoc. And so that's not a lot of time investment to spend, you know, three hours per week. Uh, but quality does trump quality, uh, quantity a lot of times, right? If you're spending that quality time with that person and you make it special and you make it about them, we're going to do what, what you care about. Um, then I think it can make up for quite frankly, being, um, busy. Now you do have to attend to people's needs on a day-to-day -day basis as well, but there's a lot you can do to massage that in terms of figuring out what's, what's appropriate. And, and in the end, just, uh, you know, um, uh, you, you, you reach a compromise and you reach a balance. And the more that you can talk about these things, uh, which also is a good life skill, like you'd be surprised how many people in the thirties cannot have this conversation about like, okay, these are, these are my needs. What are your needs? What are your expectations? How can we compromise and balance it? This is what I need. This is what you need. Um, that's a very useful life skill as well. And then the final note that I'll just chime in is look in the end you have to find someone who's aligned with your values and what you're trying to get out of life if you are a super busy person then you need to find someone who's not super dependent in terms of their personality spectrum and does want to spend five six hours with you every day um not that that's maybe that's not even healthy for anyone but there are there is a spectrum of sort of independence to dependence and people who are very busy or professional need to find people that are like a little bit more flexible at the minimum, if not a little bit more independent that can balance their time and don't have as much demand uh, and, and are on the same page, right? So if you're kind of like academically driven, professionally driven, maybe it's helpful that you either find someone that's on the same page. They're busy because they have their own lives and they're also trying to do well in school. Uh, and maybe you can even spend a lot of that time um, you know, studying together, quite frankly, right? When you find someone that's on the same page as you, you can, you can work side by side and, and it's still reasonable time, uh, together, but it's not taking you away from the things that you want to do. So, uh, in the end, finding the right person is kind of important as well. Um, and you got to find someone that's aligned with you or is very flexible, right? I, I don't want to say that the only person that's a fit for someone who's academically or professionally driven is also someone who's driven. I don't think that's actually true. And I think it's actually not true for men. In fact, finding people who are more easygoing and more agreeable can actually be a very great compliment to a very driven, successful guy. But I think you need one or the other. You either need to find, be a power couple and find someone who's totally okay with you being, spending a lot of time at work or school, or you need to find someone who may be more laid back and chill with you but is, is not uh, their expectations and their agreeableness and their flexibility is very high. Both can work, but you need sort of one or the other to make it work. All right, I'll, I'll answer this question on Instagram. Um, this uh, user, play then work hard, um, said just started TRT or it's testosterone replacement therapy. 
I'm not thrilled with getting injections every week. I feel better, but can you address any downside? So maybe this is a useful uh, opportunity to just talk a little bit about testosterone replacement therapy um, and downsides. I'm actually surprised how many people don't know about it. So it's like a useful topic to talk about. Um, so, uh, testosterone replacement therapy is generally, uh, for the treatment of low testosterone or what's called secondary hypogonadism, uh, when your body is not producing enough of its own testosterone. So the solution to that is, uh, if your body's not making enough, you can, uh, inject it. The reason it's injectable is because testosterone is not very orally bioavailable. You can't, there's no testosterone pill, uh, essentially that you can take. Um, and so you have to inject it. The downside of injecting it is one, it's obviously a pain in the ass because that's where you inject testosterone. Um, but the other part of it that's uh, a downside is um, your body is actually kind of intelligent and it realizes when it's getting enough testosterone. And so when you take it externally or exogenously, your endogenous or your internal production shuts down. And so your testes or your testicles, where the word testosterone comes from, are like, oh, I'm getting enough, we're, we're getting enough testosterone, so I can go on vacation essentially. And so your testicles literally shrink or atrophy, they become smaller, um, and they stop producing their own testosterone. The consequence of that is A, you actually become dependent on those external injections. So in a lot of ways, it's almost like a type one diabetic who cannot produce their own insulin, which is also a hormone like testosterone. And so they rely on injecting themselves with insulin. The other downside is when your, testo your testes no longer produce their own testosterone, um, you become generally infertile. And so if you still want to maintain your ability to produce sperm and have children, it's not a great idea to do TRT. Now, there are ways of mitigating that. There's something called HCG that you can take. It's another uh, hormone that's injectable that can try to maintain fertility levels while on TRT. But now you're injecting two things and handling two different drugs. Um, or you can come off of it. You can come off of TRT when you're ready to have children and your body's going to still be shut down. And so you have to do something called a PCT or post cycle therapy to almost like restart your system in a lot of ways. Think about like a car that you left in the garage for like 11 months and you didn't turn on, turn it on. The battery's clearly going to be dead. So you probably need to replace the battery and get a tune up and restart your system. So um, it is possible. I'm not saying that, that infertility is guaranteed or that it's forever. It's not. Sometimes people can still have kids like on TRT uh, if they take HCG or they can restart the system. But generally speaking, uh, it's a major risk. It's a major downside. That's why generally young men do not do TRT unless they're like a crazy bodybuilder and they don't really give a fuck, quite frankly. Uh, they're a biohacker. Uh, but I generally don't, if you, if you, unless you have what's called primary hypogonadism. So primary hypogonadism is almost like being a type one diabetic. Literally your test testes cannot produce their own testosterone because you have a testicular injury or some other issue, but that's pretty rare. You're talking about a few percentage of people. Um, if that's the case, then sure, there's no other way for you to produce testosterone. For everyone else, uh, you should try to produce your own testosterone. So I would say um, for this original question, it sounds like the downside for this guy, he's like, I don't like getting injections every week. There are, there are forms of testosterone that um, avoid injections. So there is a, essentially a gel or a cream. You can rub it on your scrotum um, and it does, uh, does absorb uh, through the skin essentially. And so that way you can obviously avoid the injections. You should go talk to your doctor about whether that's a good option for you. Um, there is a downside to that, which is like the, the moment that you put it on, you can't like rub it on your girlfriend or wife. Uh, you can't like have sex for uh, a couple hours. You have to like wash it off because it is masculinizing, right? So you don't, you don't want rubbing, you don't want testosterone rubbing off on a woman. So uh, you have to be very careful about the application and the timing of it. So that's a downside compared to the injections. But like I said, um, that's that it's still, even if you use the, the, the gel or the cream, uh, still has the same issues with shutting down your own production, still has the same issues with um, causing infertility. So uh, that's why I'm generally not a fan of TRT for young men um, or people who have secondary hypogonadism. I think it should be the second line treatment. There are um, newer solutions. In fact, this is something that we're working on at Maximus that uh, do not involve injections. They're oral medications. And in fact, they, they do the opposite. They actually stimulate your body's own production of endogenous testosterone. And so uh, I would argue um, it's it's actually a, a much more natural approach than bioidentical testosterone because 
your, your testes are producing its own testosterone, which is exactly what it should be doing. And you should be maintaining your own fertility. Um, so both for the reason of like, Hey, if you want to have kids, it's a good idea to not have, not shut down your balls and be able to produce kids. But I actually make a really interesting psychological argument as well, which is, let's say you're your guy in your twenties, you're not planning on having kids anytime soon. So you're like, well, what's the downside of becoming infertile? I think uh, a lot of guys' power is in fertility. If you literally think about it, your biological purpose in life uh, is to reproduce, right? And so the moment that you are essentially infertile, even on a subconscious level, you're like, it kind of takes your your power away, your your uh, your mojo, to use a sort of an Austin Powers analogy. And, and and maybe this is a very Freudian notion, but you know, uh, a lot of a lot of I think men's uh, success and drive and power comes from not only their testosterone um, and their libido, but but the notion of their virility, right? Their vir your virility is like, you know, like your ability to reproduce. And I think when you take that away, especially in a very artificial chemical way through TRT, it does kind of take your mojo away. Um, versus uh, with these with this newer approach, right, which is testosterone optimization or testosterone maximization through oral prescription medications that increase your fertility, it actually makes your balls bigger, increases testicular volume, increases sperm count, makes you more fertile. And like I said, whether or not you want to have kids, there is kind of a magic to be like, hey, I'm a virile man. And I think there's a lot of power in that. One last interesting anecdote on that note, I actually shared a study on Twitter today that said that um, every guy that's listening to this right now, you have half the sperm that your grandfather had, which is a very alarming statistic, right? It's kind of crazy. Sperm counts have gone down 1% per year for basically the last uh, 50 years or so. So I think from, if I recall correctly, 1973 to 2011, they've gone down 59%. It's even more than 1% a year. Um, it's very disturbing. Um, and part of that is due to lifestyle reasons like obesity, but a lot of it is due to these endocrine disrupting chemicals that I've mentioned before. Um, in fact, the Erin Brockovich, if you've ever seen that famous movie with Julia Roberts, she published that article talking about how um, these, uh, I think they're called PFAS, uh, there's a certain class of chemicals. They're especially used in um, waterproofing or flame retardants. So like fire extinguishers, waterproof jackets, uh, stain resistant carpets and couches um, have all have this chemical. And Teflon is like, and all these kind of sticky coatings that we put on stuff are full of these uh, PFASs. And they're terrible in that they linger in the environment forever. They also linger in your body forever. In fact, 95% of people have these literally in your body right now, which is a very sad fact. We've essentially polluted uh, ourselves. Um, and it's probably a major reason why um, we're less masculine and we're less ver virile than even our fathers and our grandfathers were. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a terrible tragedy. Um, that's why I think every guy, quite frankly, should be an environmentalist. Because even if you're not a hippie tree hugger, on a very practical level, it is sapping your testosterone, it's sapping your sperm count, and it's probably gonna prematurely give a lot of us cancer. And it's terrible, and we should do something to fix that. Um, but in the meantime, there is some things you should do, which is avoid those things, the things that I mentioned, if possible, um, try to and uh, try to avoid plastics uh, you know, as much as possible. Fast foods are particularly bad. Like the lining of popcorn um, bags have those chemicals. The wrappers of burgers at fast food restaurants, they use those same chemicals. So obviously like, you know, using natural products, use wood, use steel, use glass for all your containers. Uh, don't eat out as much. Uh, you can mitigate some of that damage. And then obviously we're, you know, we're working on some stuff at Maximus, the Maximus as well that can help address it a little bit more on a physiological level as well. Hey, Omid. Hey, Doc. Hey, Doc. Hey, quick question on this um, notion of hormones and, and testosterone. I'm curious about the role mental health plays in testosterone production yeah. or more so the role mental health plays in just regulating our hormones? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I'm glad you bring it up because the, 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 um, there's kind of three main hypotheses for why we're seeing this, this, um, uh, disruption in hormones, which by the way, is not just for men. Uh, so I, I talk about it cause this is obviously, you know, our, our company is very or oriented towards men. The other sad and interesting statistic is, um, Women in their 20s today have the same amount of fertility as their grandmothers did at the age of 35, 
right? When you start seeing fertility actually decline for women. And so it's affecting women just as much. By the way, this is a crazy fact too. It's not just human beings, it's affecting dogs as well. So like dogs are less, uh, have like lower testosterone fertility. Well, that's how we started to figure out that it's an environmental factor is because it's not just affecting us, like literally affecting all living creatures, including our, our, our pets that we obviously love. So, um, yeah, if, if you care about like, you know, your significant other, you care about your pets, like we should, we should all care about this beyond ourselves as well. So, uh, these environmental pollutants are, are a critical factor. The second factor is obesity um, and any, anything that contributes to obesity as a lifestyle factor. The best thing that you can do if you, if you are overweight um, is to reduce your body fat and your central adiposity. So meaning the, the body fat that you carry, carry on your belly, uh, the spare tire as, as it were. Um, so that's the second big factor. And the third big, big factor is what you are talking about, which is mental health. We know that there is an association between depression in particular and hormone function, where depression is um, you know, kind of a syndrome, if you think about it. it, it affects both the mind and body. And we know this because if you look at the questionnaires for how we assess depression, they ask for a lot of somatic symptoms. So for instance, are you sleeping too much or too little? Are you feeling tired uh, often? Um, and so th these sort of physical symptoms or manifestations of depression indicate that there is a physiological component to depression as well. The other piece of evidence for that is we know that inflammation in particular is implicated in depression. So in fact, I wrote my whole doctoral dissertation on this between the links between emotions and inflammation. You can literally take blood samples in people and based on their mood or even their life satisfaction, predict their levels of inflammation. So we know that depression, for instance, is associated with higher levels of inflammation. So these are measured in the blood in these markers called pro-inflammatory cytokines, which are just a fancy word for essentially these markers of the immune system. Um, and it's not that these uh, inflammation is bad. Um, the way that I describe it is it's like stress. Acute inflammation, acute stress is a useful thing, right? So let's say you get an injury, right? You're, you get a bump, it gets red, it gets sore, it's painful. That's because your body is trying to shunt blood to that area to heal it, to have it recover. The problem is you want that to go away after a day or two and then heal and move on. You don't want chronic levels of inflammation, just like we don't want chronic levels of stress. And so the, the problem with depression is because by definition, depression lasts two weeks or more in order to be diagnosed with clinical depression. That means you're now inducing chronic inflammation oftentimes. It's correlated. It doesn't mean you always have higher inflammation, but generally people with depression have higher inflammation. And, and inflammation and cortisol, we know are... Uh, catabolic uh, processes and their their um, uh, uh, have a have a negative sort of counterbalance to optimal testosterone function. So that's the other piece that I do think is really important to address, which is the mental health piece. So if you do have depression, like clinical levels of depression, obviously go get mental health treatment. Uh, it's totally worth it, not only for your mental health, but sadly your physical health as well, because it's going to negatively affect your your hormone function. And it's a negative spiral, right? In that if you're depressed, you have greater inflammation, your testosterone's lower, and you then you don't feel as good, and then your depression gets worse, right? So it kind of causes this negative downward spiral. So you can help sort of break out of that uh, by making sure that you're addressing your mental health as well. Uh, Super helpful. Nick, Thank you. Nick, just a uh, nil tie said, Cam, are you going to create a product to lower inflammation? <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, it's actually really interesting. Um, you know, when they started doing this research on the link between um, inflammation and depression, the, the natural logical conclusion is why aren't we using anti-inflammatories to treat depression, right? Because the way, the standard way, at least medication-wise, that we treat depression is using what are called SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. These are like Prozac, um, citalopram, Lexapro, th those kind of class of medications. They try to increase basically, uh, uh, long story short, serotonin rather than, um, uh, you know, kind of a typical NSAID or a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. Now, there, there's some interesting research that suggests that some of the reasons why these SSRIs work may be because they actually be uh, influencing inflammatory processes and nothing to do with serotonin, which is the reason that we thought they work. Um, but there, there may be some interesting... I, I don't know. I think this is pretty early, but I think there may be new classes of medications that come out that actually um, 
uh, reduce inflammation and, and may mitigate that in some way. Um, the thing is, though, it's not a perfect correlation. Like, for instance, um, there are drugs that um, are pro-inflammatory and they actually induce depression. That's how that's part of how we figured out this whole relationship. But it doesn't do it in 100 percent of people. Right. Inflammation doesn't always cause depression, maybe like 50 percent of the time. Rough estimate there. And, and we're not really sure why it affects some people more than other people. And that conversely means if you take an anti-inflammatory, it's going to help some people's depression. It may not help other people's depression. Part of that is because what we call depression, we're all lumping maybe different different uh, types of um, conditions into one big broad umbrella category. I hope in the future we can do like very quick, easy blood tests. Notice if you have high levels of inflammation and then maybe we can personalize treatment to you and say, hey, you need an anti-inflammatory. This other person, now you just had a breakup. You're dealing with some life stuff. It's not as physiological for you. It's maybe a little bit more psychological. We just need therapy and relationships and, uh, and support, and we can address you in that way. And I think that's the future of mental health is, is better better diagnosis, better personalized treatment. But in, in the meantime, um, I wouldn't recommend like playing around with that stuff. Um, like uh, NSAIDs like can ha be harsh on your liver if you're sort of taking uh, Tylenol or taking uh, naproxen um, or ibuprofen. Um, so definitely don't, don't go crazy with that stuff. Um, unless your doctor recommends it, go ahead. So in what you're talking about, where is the source of the inflammation in someone who's depressed? Is, is it the type of inflammation different than a physical injury, like a broken leg? Um, good question. It's, it's the, it's the difference between sort of local versus systemic inflammation. Um, when you when you break a leg, it's going to be a little bit more localized in that most of the inflammation is going to be around the site of injury versus in depression, it's going to be more systemic. It's literally their inflammatory markers are moving around your blood. Um, so uh, yeah, it's not, it's not localized to any particular place. That's why when you essentially take a blood sample, which is what I was doing for my doctoral dissertation, the inflammation sort of shows up and it affects kind of your whole body. Um, and that's why it may have sort of neurological effects because some of these these markers can kind of cross the blood brain barrier and and literally affect you know your brain as well. So um, you know is that sort of useful? I mean it's like it's fun physiology to kind of learn, um, but I, I do think there's a lot that we can do even on a behavioral level, and this is what I think it's useful to talk about in terms of reducing inflammation. The first thing which is so so critical is sleep is the best anti-inflammatory in my opinion that exist, right? It's like your body's restoration process. And we know, in fact, even one night of sleep deprivation. So if you get like four hours of sleep, in fact, we did this, we did these studies at the um, UCLA Cousin Center for Psychoneuroimmunology, um, which th this is what this whole field is called, it's called PNI, Psychoneuroimmunology, which is basically how the mind affects the brain, which affects your immune system, um, will jack up your inflammation just just that one night of sleep deprivation. So the, the obvious remedy for that is really try to get that seven to nine hours of sleep. It can dampen inflammation quite significantly. Now, depression is tricky because sometimes people with depression get this phenomenon called hypersomnia where they're sleeping too much. It's not from a lack of sleep. Um, and so there are other things that you can do. Um, uh, exercise and physical activity is actually very helpful. It's a kind of a funny, tricky thing though, in that obviously if you are working out, let's say you're lifting weights, you're lifting heavy, you're actually causing an acute localized inflammation, which is what I'm talking about. You're kind of tearing, causing micro tears in your muscle fibers, uh, like in your biceps, if you're working your biceps. But over time, uh, other than that, like one hour that you worked out and maybe the couple hours after, it does actually tend to lower inflammation. So that's another great sort of tactic that we can do. And then anything that's sort of like a, a deeply relaxing um, behavioral exercise. So whether you like to do uh, meditation, um, I highly actually like recommend, um, you know, jacuzzis or kind of using a sauna or steam room that can be very relaxing. And there's other benefits that have to do with heat shock proteins um, that can be uh, anti-inflammatory. Um, I highly recommend massage if you can find it and afford it. Um, it's very, very relaxing. It can, it can, it can, uh, reduce inflammation as well. So anything that's sort of like deeply relaxing and restorative also helps attenuate inflammation. And then some of the alternative, um, uh, practices as well, yoga, uh, Tai Chi, Qigong, 
um, can uh, in, in research have also been shown to reduce some of these inflammatory markers. In fact, one of my favorite studies that came out of UCLA PNI, um, I believe gave older people a vaccine. Um, I think it was for shingles, I believe. And what they did is in one group, they did Tai Chi and then the other group, they did nothing. And the combination of the Tai Chi plus the vaccine increased the level of antibodies produced in response to the vaccine compared to when they didn't do the Tai Chi. So in some ways it was like complementary. It's literally the idea of complementary medicine. It's that obviously Tai Chi does not replace a vaccine, but it makes the vaccine even better because it enhances the immune response to it. And so these practices in conjunction with conventional mainstream medicine can be very complementary. So I would say if you're really trying to reduce inflammation, focus on those health, health or lifestyle behaviors. And if you're interested in doing that, obviously in a supportive group, that's why we have this Discord community on uh, for Maximus. So you can join uh, these squads that we have if you want to work on some of these things and say, hey, you know, I just wanna do my me five minutes of meditation a day and I want some accountability from people, uh, join our squads because we have guys who are working on all these kinds of health practices and doing it in a way that focuses on mutual improvement. Yep. Uh, the guy who asked the TRT question um, asked, uh, just wanted to follow up and say, thanks, kids are not a concern, just wanna optimize my health. I am fit, but wanna be all that I can. Yeah, I love it. That's kind of like the army motto, right? Be, be all that you can be. Um, so, uh, I'm with you there, but that's why I was saying like, even if fertility per se is not a concern, I do think guys should sort of think about, you know, the pros and cons of, of any particular sort of treatment. Um, and yeah, there are alternatives. We'll talk more about that, but I would say if you just go to maximustribe.com, um, you can sign up for our email list and, and as we sort of launch, um, and, uh, you know, bring that out to the public, I'm happy to talk more about it. So stay tuned. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Cam. You're talking about inflammation. Uh, moving forward, have you seen, so with ulcerative colitis, have you had seen anything um, that potentially allows, it will eliminate it completely? I've been told that it will be with you your whole life, but have you seen anything that's kind of active with that, like trying to do stress management, workout, exercise, go you know, that route, but have you seen anything to work towards that with inflammation? Yeah, that's a great question. Ulcerative colitis is a really tough condition. Um, and it, 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 you know, it, it kind of um, falls into this category of um, IBD, inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and uh, you see other kind of conditions similar to this, like Crohn's. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a tough condition. And, I, and I, I'm not aware it can totally be um, treated behaviorally. Like I said, with uh, just like the vaccine, um, it may be that these behavioral approaches may be complementary to sort of the standard treatments that, uh, you know, your doctor's providing. And so, like I always say, that you shouldn't do these things as a replacement for care, um, but it can be complementary. Now, the one exception to this is IBS. So inflammatory bowel syndrome, which is different than ulcer uh, ulcerative colitis, is a little bit more psychosomatic. Um, and what particularly works, and I have a lot of clinical experience doing this, is um, hypnosis. So there's, in fact, a standardized six-session protocol that's hypnosis for IBS. It's very well validated. There's a bunch of research studies on it. And in fact, it has one of the largest effect sizes of any behavioral treatment. I think it's like 0.5. It's a, it's a pretty strong, like a medium effect size. Um, and it can help a lot with IBS. And interestingly, the mechanism, and this brings this entire conversation full circle, is it can help stimulate, my theory is it stimulates the vagus nerve, which is, has this anti-inflammatory uh, effect on the body and the vagus enervates literally the digestive system. And so it can actually dampen inflammation in the gut. Now, um, I don't know specifically if hypnosis has been used for ulcerative colitis, but given the how helpful it's been in IBS, I would say maybe it's something worth looking into and consult with your doctor, obviously, if it would be helpful as a complementary treatment to what you're already doing. Like I said, it's not going to be a replacement for it but maybe it can help with some of the symptom reduction. It's not gonna get rid of ulcerative colitis. I, I don't wanna make that promise, probably not. Um, but in terms of like flares or outbreaks or, or, or um, you know, uh, exacerbations of symptoms that you may be experiencing, it can really, it, it may be able to help um, if the research from IBS is a useful proxy for ulcerative colitis. I'll actually, after the show, I'll do a little bit of research in, in PubMed I, to, to up, update myself on the studies. I haven't done a lot of UC uh, ulcerative colitis treatment 
Um, but maybe there's some newer studies that suggest that hypnosis could be helpful for it. So I would say uh, it's worth researching, looking into, and obviously talk to your provider. Awesome. That's helpful. Yeah, no problem. I just have a quick question. So if with uh, uh, recaptopurine or 6-MP um, prescribed for like ulcerative colitis, <clears throat> and so with the gut inflammation as well, which yeah. has an impact on mental health as well, could you see those two potentially challenging your mental health? That I don't know. If you have, if you have a specific question about your medication, um, that's a good question to bring up with your provider. I, I, I'm not a GI doc, um, so that, that goes outside of my area of expertise. Um, but if you do have a concern about it, yeah, definitely bring it up with them. Um, and, you know, look, the, the reality is every medication has its pros and cons. Um, you know, all, all medications, quite frankly, have side effects. And in fact, some of those side effects are often treatments. Uh, I always joke that, you know, Viagra is a great example of that. It's, it was originally a, a hypertensive medication to lower blood pressure, also improves erections. And now it's marketed for that purpose. So uh, one man's side effects is another man's treasure. Um, I don't know if in the case of this ulcerative colitis drug, it has secondary effects on mental health as well. Um, but if you're concerned about it and you're experiencing symptoms around it, uh, talk to your doctor about it because maybe <clears throat> they could potentially switch medications or they can provide medications that can attenuate maybe some of the side effects. Sometimes people do are put on like multiple medications to help sort of balance uh, the different medications out. So talk to your provider about that. Awesome. That sounds good. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Get it. Absolutely. A very broad, broad array of questions today uh, span mind, body, uh, and health. Um, but thank you very much for asking all of it. Um, and we'll uh, recommence next week. So we, we host the show every Thursday at six o'clock, always prioritizing the live questions. Um, so you can join us on Discord, Facebook, Clubhouse, Instagram, YouTube Live. So thank you for joining us today and have a wonderful evening, everyone.